Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is part nine of the Theodore Robert Bundy series. Now he's on the radar. If you haven't caught parts one through eight, this is now the time to push that pause button and we'll be right here when you're caught up. And note, these are true crime videos. They're not made for children and they do contain sensitive subject matter. So viewer discretion is advised. It's around August 19th, 1975, and Ted Bundy is now on Seattle's radar. He was still in jail for the traffic violation that revealed what was thought to be burglary tools in his trunk. A cap, ice pick, rope, pry bar, pantyhose mask, handcuffs, and trash bags. And as you can see in this follow-up report, the different offices, sheriff's offices, are starting to liaise about this. Keep in mind that by this time, Ted's name had already been called into the Ted hotline to the police at least three times. Once by Ann Rule from his crisis clinic days. Second, a professor, Joel Kestenbaum of the University of Washington. He was one of Ted's professors. And third, by Liz Klepfer, his girlfriend of many years, she called in multiple times. Detective Jerry Thompson was the one who finally put the name Bundy to the other Ted's. Around this time, Liz sees Ted's old landlady, who tells Liz she'd been visited by the King County Police. So Liz calls him back again. She speaks with Kathy McChesney, and she tells... Liz about Ted's arrest, not for speeding, that's what he had told Liz, but for the burglary tools. See, Liz is still at this point, even though she's called into the police before, she's naive and she literally wants him either rolled in or ruled out. It was August 8th when Liz had called King County and she told them how she told Ted she knew about his arrest. So she confronted Ted about the arrest, how he had lied and told her it was for speeding. And Ted had demanded back to know, who told you? And she was just vacillating. She was extremely jealous of Ted's other women because now he was living in another state. And at one point, Liz had tried to get her own father in Utah to liaise with the authorities. But her own father refused to talk to the authorities. And he said, quote, if you're wrong, you'll ruin his career. And here's the letter that I ended my last video with. It's August 20th, 1975. It's the tie together letter from Ben Forbes to Robert Keppel. So thought you'd be interested in this, suggesting that perhaps our Ted may be your Ted. August 21st, 22nd, 1975, they're charging Ted with the possession of the burglary tools. And Ted executed, he signed a voluntary search of his own residence. He very clearly signed the consent form. And for some reason, I couldn't find it in all my documents. I literally have about a thousand documents here. So anyway, I couldn't find it, but it's online. You can go into the internet archive and look through all the different case files. He clearly signed the consent form. So, so much for his claim of not consenting to the search of his residence. Present for the search were Ben Forbes and Jerry Thompson. Mind you, this is an apartment filled with stolen goods, but probably mostly stolen goods from Washington. The search was on the pretense of looking for stolen property, but the officers were keeping an eye out for anything regarding abducted or missing women. The officer saw three pairs of shiny patent leather loafers. Keep in mind that Carol DeRanche and also Ray Lynn Shepard had noted that this mysterious person had worn patent leather shoes. Ted even allowed them to take some bills, some credit card statements he had laying around. One major gaffe he made was leaving out this Colorado ski guide. And when they looked later, there was a little check mark or a hash mark by the Wildwood Inn. This photo is from the Hi, I'm Ted website and Facebook page by Tiffany Jean. I highly recommend it. There was also a brochure advertisement for Viewmont High School, the play in Bountiful. And after finding the Colorado ski brochure with the 
later found the little X next to the Wildwood Inn. They asked him, like, let me paraphrase, like, you ever been to Colorado, Ted? And he said no. And then later he claimed the brochure had been left by a friend. And the officer, after he found the Bountiful Re Recreational Resort doc paraphernalia, he said, ever been to Bountiful? And Ted says no. And he claimed another friend left it. So Ted was basically overconfident and a bad liar. In addition to the Joy of Sex book, which was common in that time, it was a common book to have around if you were an, an adult, there was also oddly junior and majorette magazines. That's magazines of preteens in little outfits, twirling batons and stuff, and they believe in retrospect that was stroke material. Jerry Thompson later recalled to Dr. Carlisle, that's a psychiatrist who will later interview Ted, that the apartment search was odd because, quote, Ted offered me the world in the search, but he also, at that same time, while acting like, oh, you know, look at anything, take anything, he also watched Thompson like a hawk. He said that Ted's apartment was totally immaculate. Everything was lined up. The coat hangers in his closet were perfectly two inches between each other. And also, Ted went on to telephone Jerry Thompson in the later years, quote, like he was my friend. And Jerry just suspected that Ted was always calling to find out what Jerry knew. Then they took a Polaroid photo of Ted's VW Bug. Ted had taken the primer and painted over the rust spots. He later then gave the VW a new paint job. He changed the hubcaps and he put in a new back seat. The other one had a rip. Ted was known to clean his VW within an inch of its life. And then he proceeded to sell it, claiming that he needed to pay his attorney's fees. And he moved from the rooming house. After the search of his rooming house, Ted said cockily, now you've got a straw. He laughed, he said, you're trying to fill up a broom, keep going and someday you might make it. Ted lawyered up using John O'Connell pictured here. And in a laughable move, O'Connell tried to revoke the voluntary search form, the search of the residence, but the search had already been concluded. August 26, 1975, his girlfriend Liz continues calling and speaking with King County Police. And she tells King County, you know, about how in the past she'd seen the plaster of Paris in Ted's room, that Ted was familiar and he'd even been to Lake Sammamish the week before the Lake Sammamish abductions and that he didn't have a good time. She tells him how she found several items in his room at different times that were suspicious, like a brown bag full of women's clothing. And that once she'd found a hatchet under the seat of his Volkswagen, another time she found a knife in the glove compartment, that she knew he had a stolen TV. There were follow-up calls, as you see here, talking about cleaver-like meat tenderizer she found. She once found crutches in his room. And then Ted had said the crutches belonged to his landlord. Liz talked about how often when they were out driving, Ted would look for roads off the main road. She told him how Ted carried a fake mustache and that he sometimes wore it to look cool. I mean, all of this was damning information. At one point, she's even asked if she knew about the rip in the backseat of Ted's car, and she said it had been there for a year. And she was asked if she knew if it was fixed, and she didn't know. All this becomes important because the police are tying in Carol Durant's abduction, attempted abduction, and attempted murder to Ted. Initially, she's shown a stack of photos, and she takes out Bundy's from the stack. And then she looks through the photos and she hands it back and says, I don't, she didn't know about the photos in the stack. She gave the stack back, but she was still holding Bundy's photo. And then they said, what about the one in your hand? Because she had said the man isn't there in the main stack. And they said, what about that one? And she's like, meh, I don't know. Because keep in mind, he was quite a chameleon in his photos. And I believe it's before the lineup where she positively identifies Ted, which we'll get to, that she does identify the VW from the Polaroid photos as looking similar to the one in which she was abducted. September 5th, 1975, Salt Lake City Police surveillance starts. So the logs are on the internet archive. 
The Salt Lake police are concerned that Ted had been abducting women and they found it necessary to surveil him. So on September 10th, since Ted was aware of some of the surveillance and acting very squarely, trying to do maneuvers, the police obtained permission to use the upper floor of a nearby insurance building in order to surveil him. So Ted was acting hinky, he was acting nervous. He was clearly aware of the unmarked police cars. He enjoyed playing games with the detectives. And it was also around this time, as noted in the surveillance reports, that Ted had joined the Mormon church. He'd been flirting around with the idea before then. The surveillance reports also notes that at this time, Liz, who was still hanging out with Ted, owned a VW herself, a light green one. Some people from this time period recalled Ted. Michael Priest, a Mormon branch president, said that they'd knocked on Ted's door, introduced themselves, and they formed a relationship with Ted, which led him to be baptized. And on a 2015 high school alumni message board, Carol Hall Bartholomew, who's shown here on the left, wrote about the potential convert, Ted Bundy, how he was invited to the house of a male friend, for social gatherings and Ted was baptized into the Mormon religion and this well-known picture of them shows them washing dishes and she said that back in February of 1975 one of the friends noticed Ted returned back to Utah with four evenly spaced scratch marks on the side of his face so it's likely that one of his victims scratched him and Dr. Carlisle that's the just psychiatrist who will later interview Ted will later go on to say that he believed Ted wanted to stop killing and thought that going to the church might help and barring that if it didn't work then going to church and getting baptized just added another layer of patina to his persona in other words it's a win-win if Mormonism keeps the entity at bay it's a win and if it doesn't being seen as a good Mormon just adds another layer of normalcy and patina that's how manipulative Ted was. September 17th, 1975, Ted had placed an advertisement in the newspaper and he ended up selling the VW to a teenager, Brian S., who paid Ted $800 for it. Ted drove the VW to Brian's house in Sandy. Ted penned a handwritten bill of sale that same date, selling the, quote, beige 1968 Volkswagen sedan to him, and the VW was later seized by police, an evidence sample sent to the lab for analysis. On October 2nd, 1975, Carol Durant picked Ted out of a lineup at the Metropolitan Hall of Justice, and Ted was a chameleon. He changed his appearance for this lineup. He cut his hair short. He parted it on the other side. But Carol and some of the other witnesses from the Deborah Kent abduction were also there, and they all selected Ted from this lineup. Also wanted to note that Carol Durant had also recognized Ted's VW in spite of his attempts to cover up the VW to change its paint, to fix its rust spots, and the ripped back seat. There was a scratch on the passenger seat, and she pointed to it and said, I remember this scratch. By October 3rd, the next day, his arrest made the papers. He was charged with aggravated kidnap and attempted criminal homicide for the Carol Durant attack. He was held in lieu of $100,000 bail. Of course, Ted's friends and his family could not believe he could be charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal homicide. And Ted's mother was quoted, Could my son do these things? Of course not. What a stupid thing to ask a mother. In no way could he do these things. End quote. His landlady, Frida Roger, agreed. She spoke that her lodger was a very fine fellow. Even neighbors reported he was quiet and shy. I'm absolutely flabbergasted, said a friend who worked as an intern with Bundy. He has impeccable taste. He's a bright boy, very bright intellectually astute very political my heart is pounding so hard i can hear it but we know that ted was an expert at keeping his relationships compartmentalized on october 3rd the tacoma news tribune printed how bundy was one of the 2800 ted's checked by a special police unit 
and remarked how he had already been thoroughly checked out and eliminated. Now, in retrospect, I don't know if they just put that into the into the atmosphere in order to kind of throw him off that they were leaning towards him. By October 16th, the authorities sought a blood sample from Ted to compare with the blood found on Carol Durant's clothing after she scratched her assailant. The O blood type sample was sent for testing, but there was an insufficient amount to produce the RH factor. It turns out Ted also had blood type O. On October 28, 1975, Detective Robert Keppel and John Cowell, who was a cousin of Ted's, went to the area they, the area Ted and his cousin used to hike. Turns out it was the same area the Taylor Mountain victims were found. Coincidence? I don't think so. Keppel's opinion was that Ted knew the area very well. Tick tock. October 31st, November 1st, law enforcement in Colorado are waiting to speak with the Utah authorities. Colorado wanted to question Ted regarding the disappearances of three women, Karen Campbell, Julie Cunningham, and Elise Lynn Oliverson. November 12th, 1975, Buddy was having difficulty getting approval for bail, which was set for $100,000. It was later reduced his parents put up the required 10%, but did not have the entire amount without the help of a bail bondsman. Bundy thought he was getting released on the 12th, but then was in the release room and he had to go back to his cell. Meanwhile, on November 13th and 14th, Colorado, 29 law enforcement officers meet with the Pitkin County Sheriff. So we've got Colorado, Utah, California, and Washington authorities all putting their heads together regarding the unsolved homicides in their areas. So these weren't so secret meetings Keppel attended and he told an interesting story of Ted relaying at one point, at, I think he said it was at the age 13, his peer group found Ted pleasuring himself in a closet at school and that they later threw water on him. This was like in a long I would call it like a think tank where everybody puts their stuff together and tries to figure out stuff. I had never heard that story otherwise, but apparently he told that story at this meeting. By November 20th, Bundy was finally granted bail. He went back to Liz, even though she'd squealed on him. He forgave her. He thought she was doing her civic duty, so he forgave her, and his bond was paid by Ted's mother, and $12,000 was put towards his legal defense. The Bundy family mortgaged their home to get bail and to help finance the defense. Ted said, quote, they made a lot of financial sacrifices. They went in hawk for me, end quote. Ted and Liz were constantly tailed by undercover police, and Ted adopted the alias Christopher Robbins. When Liz asked him why he was arrested, Ted admitted that he wasn't doing well in school. He was getting B's and C's. I think by this time he was doing worse than that. And he would get into his car and drive, like driving to Colorado. Ted told Hugh Ainsworth that once he was bonded out that day, he went for pizza. And that Louise Bundy wanted to talk to him about his birth father, but Ted had too much to deal with and he didn't talk to her about it. Ted would later confess that once he was released on bail, he destroyed a shoebox of Polaroids that he had taken of the victims. So those were his trophies. The shoebox was stored in the utility room of the boarding house. In the next video, we'll be talking about the Carol DeRange trial and how Ted is fully on the radar for many of these missing women and how his carefully crafted persona slowly begins falling apart. So if you found this video interesting, if you found it informative, please hit that like button. Please hit the subscribe bell and without further ado, have an excellent day. Bye.